particularly for your very generous words. And um, it's a privilege and a joy to be able to, to pastor uh, this church that we love very dearly. And we're excited to see what the Lord is going to do. Very excited as we believe in a big God. And we know he uh, is going to do great things through, through this fellowship. So we are excited. So we find ourselves uh, continuing uh, through the book of John. So if you're visiting today, we've been going through uh, the Gospel of John. And the intention was really just, it uh, was very simple. We wanted to, as we were in this new chapter of, uh, of church beginnings, new church beginnings, we wanted to really drill down and consider the life of Christ and see and hear his words and see what he did and his actions and what he commanded us to do. And so I, I hope you've been finding uh, the series uh, going, going well and beneficial and encouraging for your faith so far. We're, we're uh, a good um, come up to three months into it, I think, and we find ourselves now in, uh, in chapter eight. But we're going to take a break after today for the month of, of July. And that uh, goes through to our, our connect groups as well, which is why the summer theology thing's up. So we're going to take a break from the Gospel of John for the month of July and come back to it uh, for August. So here we are as we finish off John for a period of time. And we're in at chapter eight. And we're going to be picking up from verse 12. Some of you will notice in your Bibles how there's a chunk that's bracketed at the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. And that is just because when you go back to the oldest manuscripts, this chunk, this story here, although no scholar doubts it actually happened, probably chronologically wasn't in this place. Uh, so that's why it's in brackets in probably most of your Bibles today. So it actually picks up from last week uh, where we looked at the living waters to Verse 12, I am the light of the, of the world. And that's what we're going to be picking up uh, from today. So let me read that. I am the light of the world. Uh, this is from verse 12, chapter 8. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Father God, we pray uh, as we come to Christ, as we see it in our Bibles, in the word, we pray, Lord, that it would be illuminated in our hearts and in our minds and that we would come to recognize again, uh, please refresh in us, Lord, this well-known statement that your son is the light of the world and he's called to walk in light. So, Lord, help us with this, we pray. Be glorified, Lord, through this time together as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wonder what you think of when you think of this term uh, light. We often think of light, I guess, just in humanistic terms of something that uh, helps us to be able to see. Uh, so we can picture when we're in darkness, when light comes through, uh, it brings with it clarity or sight. So if you've ever spent much time out walking in the darkness, we need light to be able to guide us where to walk. Uh, the children's youth group not that long ago were down at the beach and they were crabbing or whatever you call it out here. And the way in which they could walk along the beach and not sort of uh, mindlessly or carelessly drift off into the ocean was because the moon provided light for them or they had their torch lights to be able to shine in people's eyes and blind one another and throw crabs at each other but you you need light for direction and for clarity and to guide you you know the bible uses the word light a great deal in fact when you look in the gospel of john this is a repetitive theme for him again and again he brings it up in fact in the gospel of john 22 times he brings up this theme light so it's very important to us, and the Bible has a great deal to say on it. So we can all think of, of scriptures throughout the Old Testament about how we need the light of God to guide our path so we can find a way forward, which is his word. In the New Testament, it brings it up a great deal as well. And it's often framed in the New Testament more so as being something uh, that is compa uh, comparing itself to, uh, so light and darkness is comparing itself to good and to evil. Right? So when you think through the books such as Ephesians, which speaks about spiritual warfare, it brings up this terminology of good and dark, oh, sorry, good and evil and light and darkness. And we are called to walk in this light as believers. Again, you'll see that throughout the scriptures, particularly books like, like Ephesians. We are called, in fact, children of light. And we are called to walk in that light. It also pictures itself as uh, light and darkness, as light being from God. So when it speaks of God, it says in him there is no darkness, there's only light. He's the father of light. And when, it's, when you think of Satan and you think of all of the evil principalities, you think of that as, as darkness. And when you look in this world, it's not hard to see that spiritual battle at play, is it? If when we look around the world now and we look at our, our TV screens and we see what's going on in the newspapers, and we see what's going on on our news channels, 
are we not seeing unfolded before us this great sort of battle between good and evil, light and darkness? You know, this is something that was very obvious to us as a, um, as a, as a family in the last place where we were, uh, where, where my pastor was in the place up in England, the north of England. So if you think, if you've been to London, which some people have, and you've been there and you think, my goodness, that's dark and dreary. You know, the further, I don't know why you're laughing, the further up north you go, it just gets a bit more dark and dreary. And so when our last pastor had moved us from London, okay, which sees sunshine maybe four days a year, okay, when we moved up to Manchester in the north of England, that's more like one day a year you see the sun, okay, because it is like, the only way I can describe it, it's like living in a black and white TV. It really is. But it's so interesting that when you go further up north and, you know, great church, love the people, they're real battlers, um, but actually living in this sort of uh, state actually has a medical condition for some people. Do you know that? And I know some people sort of say, oh, you're just coming up with conditions and terms for, and phrases for everything now. But actually, there's actually um, uh, medical studies on how the seasons and how the lack of sunlight can actually impact your mood and your overall well-being. And even to the point of, uh, of depression for some people. And it's very interesting. In our last place where we were, where we were I keep wanting to say stationed, I don't mean that, where our pastor it was up in Manchester, in this particular area where it was very dark and gloomy and there was a real sort of uh, a spiritual battle at, at, at work. When you look at what's going on in terms of uh, psychological issues and depression, that area had the highest levels of depression in the whole of, of England. So you see that we need lights and we need even something so, ba so, so basic that we take for granted. We need sunshine and it generally impacts your mood overall, which is the reason why I'm, I'm smiling a lot more because I've moved from Manchester out to Hawaii and the sun is always out, okay? And it's cheered me up and I'm very happy to be here, okay? It impacts our mood. And even if you look at Amy, my wife, her, her MS was suffering terribly when there was no sunshine and there was no light. But being out here, praise the Lord, because we don't say touch wood, okay? Praise the Lord, since being out here in the sunshine, she hasn't had uh, any relapses at all in the sunshine because it just impacts your mood. We need light. But... Of course, the application here from the Bible is that Jesus is saying that I am the light of the world going on beyond the sun, that you need my light to shine in your life because outside of Christ, we are living in darkness. So again, the Bible uh, uses that, it picks up on, uh, on our walk with God, our walk with Jesus, that we are called as children of light. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and we need to walk in that light. Some of you that may be around my age, the wrong side of 40, uh, okay, and beyond, or maybe a bit younger. The best, sorry, the best side of 40, probably gauging ages here. But remember that old song. Do you remember that old song, DC Talk? Anyone here remember that one? Okay, about walking in the light? No, just me. I am not going to sing it. You will soon run out. But this, this idea as we as believers need to walk in that light. We need that light. And so when I think back to my own testimony, I think of, you know, even the fact I was brought up, many of you know, in a Christian family, I was brought along to, to church, who knows how many times a week, and I went along to the Christian camps, and I got dragged along to the prayer meetings, and I, I, I was proselytized to death, okay? But when I rebelled against that, and I chased after the darkness of this world, I found myself trapped inside of a spiritual prison. That's what it was. Because moving away from Jesus, the light, puts us in the prison, a prison of darkness. And I was trapped and I was bondage and I was a slave to sin and a slave to darkness. And I can remember as I pursued after so many different things to try and bring light to my life and try and bring me happiness. I just found myself more entrenched in darkness and more confined to that prison. And I knew at that point that everything that my parents had told me growing up as I came to the end of my uh, at the end of my tether, I just felt like I was just in a point of desperation. I thought, right, I need to come back to that light. I need to come back to, to Christ. And I came to him and I brought to him my guilt and my hatred and my anger and my bitterness and my addictions. All of my darkness I brought to him. And I can just remember that freedom that came through surrendering to Jesus, the light of the world. The only way in which I can really describe it is from the old hymn that some of you will know. John Wesley, uh, Charles, Charls Wesley, sorry, whose uh, who's hymn is really my hymn when I think through my life. You'll remember it. Some of you might say it along in your, 
despite the strange sort of language in your, in your minds now. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's nights. That was me in that prison. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon that I was in, flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and I followed thee. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. How many people is that your testimony today? Rescued from the prison of darkness into the glorious light. Freedom in the light. You know, there's this uh, verse a bit later on in chapter 10 where Jesus is speaking. And he says, uh, sorry, chapter, chapter 8, verse uh, 34. So Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. They're in darkness. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How many people again here, who's that, is that your testimony here today? You can say amen if you want. Amen. We've been set free from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And now as the kingdom of light, we walk in that light. So John writes a bit later in his other letters, 1 John 1, 7. He says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We do not walk according to the old patterns of darkness anymore. We walk as children of light. Now, does that mean we don't ever find ourselves in darkness, not because of our sinful choices, but because of the darkness of the world we live in? Well, yes, of course we do. We live in a dark world. And with so many ideologies and religions seeking to offer that enlightenment seeking to pull us away really they're just all masking the fact that they are leading us to darkness what we need to do is to come to jesus in our passage today jesus says i am the light of the world and so whilst it's true to say that jesus is the light that overcomes the darkness i'd like to put a bit of context to what jesus is saying here because what you may or may not know from this famous line i am the light of the world is that there's a whole other application going on. It's so wonderful to dig a bit deeper on this. And it's one of historical significance and meaning that I'd like to show you today. And so as I do that, my aim is for you, when you say, I believe that Jesus is the light of the world, you understand that, what that means a little bit more and how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament patterns. And I think that as we, as we look back to that, what we see here is three aspects about Jesus that I hope you can bank in your hearts today, three aspects. So if you turn with me in your Bibles, so I'll read in chapter 8, verse 12, uh, you'll see if we skip back a little bit to what we looked at last week, we were reminded of how Jesus was in the temple grounds, do you remember, where he was teaching halfway through a series of festivals. And it's the last festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, that we considered last week, which, remember, was the time that God had his people, where they looked back and remembered how God had his people in tents in the wilderness, and his people were complaining about this and about everything, but especially that they had no water. Do you remember in the wilderness? So they had no water. They were complaining to Moses about it, about whinging about everything. Uh, so what God got Moses to do was to get his staff and to whack the rock. And what came out? Water. Enough to satisfy many, many people, which some scholars say maybe even over a million people. God provided water in the wilderness. And that's what they were looking back to during that festival. And as Jerusalem celebrated God's provision, which signified God leading them into a place of abundance and much water, Jesus at that point last week stood up and said, actually, what you celebrate physically, water and refreshment, is found spiritually in me. But it wasn't just a time where water during this festival was the only symbolism that Jesus used. It was also during this festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, a, a time of light. In fact, this was a great time of excitement. And the only way you can compare it by today's standards is to New Year's Eve. Or maybe to some other um, celebration you guys go on about, July the 4th or whatever. I don't know what that's about. But, okay, well, you put on like these big, these big light shows and you celebrate with your fireworks. I don't know. We just kind of stay in that night. Not much going on. Okay. We just stay in and drink our tea, all grumpy. Okay, and actually, I say that, but we got dragged out last time to, to, to Pearl Harbor with the whole family, and we were the, the seven quietest sort of Brits you can ever imagine. We were all putting on our fake accents, pretending to be American, down at Pearl Harbor during July the 4th. So anyway, 
this festival was a time where there was a great sense of, of joy, much like New Year's Eve and much like July the 4th out these parts, a sense of joy and excitement. And one of the ways they would celebrate was not to go and buy some knockoff illegal fireworks from China, but to dance and sing psalms with their torches and to come up with these huge sort of light lanterns and, and build these huge light displays around the Jerusalem temple and in the outer courts. You know, they actually built uh, four great big columns, candelabras, okay? One commentator says that these four columns were around 75 foot tall. And at the top of each of these columns were four giant bowls, so 16 bowls in total spread out around the outer courts in the Jerusalem temple. And they were filled with the oil and the way in which they would uh, sort of uh, uh, drench the oil. And the material was apparently through the old, uh, the, the, the preceding years, the, uh, the, the priest garments, so they would pour oil on them and they'd use them as lanterns to light up the whole of the area and the temple grounds. In fact, if you refer to the most credible historian of the day, Josephus, he said that they were so big, they wouldn't just light up the temple, but they would light up the whole city. So when you're picturing Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, picture that as a backdrop, yeah? Doesn't it add a bit of color to our, our reading today? And the point of this act of remembrance was this, that in the darkness of the wilderness, no man's land, God was leading his people. That's why they had light there, to remind them that God always led his people in darkness, in the wilderness. And I wonder if we pause for a moment, how many people have ever felt like that? They've just felt like they're in a time of wilderness and darkness, but they've remembered and looked back and give testimony to how even though you've gone through that period of, of doubt and darkness, that actually God's hand was always upon us, holding us even as the old... Uh, analogy of footprints goes, sometimes even carrying us through that time. But maybe some of us look back and say, Lord, I know, or we find ourselves saying today, Lord, I know your word says you'll lead me, but I just can't see it. I don't feel it today. Or well, this was a reminder for them that when you don't feel it, look back and see how God has always led his people. So the, the reference to looking back for them as they lit up the whole of Jerusalem was, if you remember, how the Israelites were delivered from captivity in Egypt and they were panicking in the wilderness saying, where is God? What have you done, Moses? Where have you led us to? The Egyptians are chasing after us now. So a reference back to Exodus 13, 21, where it says the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and in night by a pillar of fire to give them light so that they may travel by day and by night. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that is really cool. And actually, if you spend the time to not skip over the details and all oh, actually picture that, maybe you can imagine going camping. I know maybe some people here just don't want to go camping. Uh, my, my good wife is one of them. I, she gave me, I, I had one chance. Amen, some people. I had one chance as, a, as an ex-soldier to take my wife camping and show her what the outdoor life is like. And I blew it by buying like a one-man tent with just me, her, and a 30, and a sort of a, uh, an 86-kilogram dog that just snored and blew off all the time. And she was like, I ain't ever going camping again. Okay, but maybe some of you have been camping and it was an enjoyable experience. And you can remember just sort of uh, sitting out uh, by the campfire and just feeling the warmth of the fire and looking up at the stars and just seeing that fire and being mesmerized it. Can you picture how this is happening on an even bigger scale? Picture like around a million people. They've, they've left, they've been delivered from Egypt and they're out and there's this pillar of fire at night. And they're looking up at it and they're going, God is here. God's presence is with us. Isn't that amazing? I think it is. Don't skip the details. And I think back to times in my life again where it's just felt like darkness. Darkness all around me. Think back to my times of being homeless or feelings of abandonment from my family or broken ministry trying to feed a family or trapped on drink and drugs. But in that darkness, just seeing at various points how God was shining his, his light into my darkness and just looking back and thinking, God is so good, so faithful, always leading, always there with his people, even during those times of darkness. If you know that, say amen. So I see now the hand of God that rescued me and brought me back into the light. You know, David was one of those many people who likewise knew God's presence and his light in times of darkness. So in Psalm 27 that we read earlier, which scholars say was written when he was either being chased by a very jealous and angry King Saul trying to kill him 
or possibly during his uh, jealous or son Absalom, who was trying to usurp him and take the throne. But either way, it was a time of great darkness in King David's life. Uh, life. And in that darkness, David knew, which is an encouragement to us to read again and hear together, that the Lord is my light and my salvation. He's my light and I can trust him. And we know then as believers that we we always face times of darkness in our lives and times where we felt like we're in that valley of darkness. But we can know, as David did and as the Israelites knew, as they celebrated in this festival, that God is there and his hand is steady and his nature can be trusted at all times. So as the Israelites fled from the Pharaoh of Egypt, they're experiencing a literal darkness as they were chased through the desert. But what the Feast of Tabernacles reminded them was that <coughs> was that the God that delivered them from captivity was also protecting them in the darkness. And Exodus 13 shows us how. So do you remember, if you follow with me, uh, a pillar of cloud by day and what by night? Fire by night, that's right. So God here provided light in the darkness, and this was something that God's people remembered as the torches were lit and they were celebrating with joy, and they would say and they would sing, Our oh, God provides light. And again, the, the historian Josephus says that there was no celebration like this festival. It's the most joyous and exuberant one of them all. And it's here in the midst of the Feast of Tabernacles. With all of this going on as the backdrop, these big candelabras lighting up the whole city and people waving their lights and their torches and their lanterns around, that Jesus stands up in the midst of it all to declare amongst his following and the crowds that have come, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Doesn't that add more color to our reading today, thinking that Jesus standing up saying that, that is fulfilled in me. So what is Jesus alluding to? Well, assuming it's a reference to the Exodus accounts, which I believe it is. Let me give you a couple of things, three, three things that show us what Jesus means by claiming to be the light of the world, the light that we and you should follow today. So jump back in a time machine with me back to something like uh, 12 or 1400 years BC. We're in the Sinai wilderness. And it's interesting that when you look chronologically over chapters uh, six, seven and eight, what we see is a three great wilderness images that Jesus implies points to him. The first was that Yahweh provides manna from, from heaven. Do you remember when he's reading the 5,000? And he's saying that as, as, as God, as our, my father provided manna for you in the wilderness, so I am the bread of life, which John records in chapter 6, the bread of life. Second, we see how Yahweh provided water from the rock which John records chapter 7, where Jesus is saying, as I provided water for you in the wilderness, I am the living water. It's also fulfilled in Jesus' piercing at the cross. And the third from John 8, so it's a series of three, is a reference to the desert in Exodus 13 that we just read, where God provides a cloud by day and fire by night. And Jesus saying, I am the light that you need to follow of the world. So let's break that down a bit. And the first thing to note is that both the cloud and the fire, first point, first observation, both the cloud and the fire were given to provide, what? Direction. Direction to God's people. To lead them to the promised land. So Exodus 13, 21 says, And the Lord went before them along the way, along by day, in a pillar of cloud, to lead their, why? To lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire, to give them light, that they might, what? Travel by day and by night. So this is a reference to God leading his people. So God's presence, God's light was there to lead and direct his people. But a couple of other observations. What is a pillar of cloud? Well, a pillar of cloud would have been very useful as the Israelites were chased into Sinai wilderness. I don't know if you've ever even thought about this before. I've been to Egypt. I've been to the Middle East. It is hot. It is Bakersville. Okay, it hits like 90, 100 and sometimes even hotter. I have to translate that in my head from Celsius. And when you've been out in the heat for any small amount of time, what do we all look for? I know because I've hang out, hung out with most of you. We look for shade. And when I hear of this, I think of uh, the soldiers, uh, Psalm, as they used to say for me, Psalm 91, when I was in the desert in Iraq, there was the soldier's prayer where King David says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under, does anyone know? Under the shadow of the Almighty under his shadow. David says, I will say of the Lord, 
He is my refuge and my fortress under his shadow. My God, in him I will trust. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. So God is not only directing his people, but his pillar of uh, this cloud is also providing for his people, what? Shelter. Somewhere for God's people to run to and to take cover. Again, it says in the Bible, the righteous shall run to him and be saved. The Lord is a strong tower. and We can run and we can take refuge under him. Has anyone ever felt like you needed that in your life? You just need to run to God and take cover under his wings. Isn't that a wonderful picture of our God? Lord, I feel like I'm getting it from all angles here. I need to just run and take cover under your wings. God only, not only leads and directs, but he provides shelter for you to run to, take cover, and to be safe. And then thirdly, so what about the pillar of fire, which if you're an outdoorsy person, no. But again, this was not just to, to lead, to be seen, to be led. But what does fire offer us? It's not a trick question, no. Offers us warmth. Because guess what? Deserts get cold at night. And protection from wild animals. It offers protection from wild animals. And those crazy Hawaiian mosquitoes, uh, like the size of birds out here, just want to drink all your blood. Okay, the Egyptians, it says in the word, could not penetrate this column of fire between them and God's people. God was protecting them. In Exodus 14, 19, it says that the angel of the Lord went both before them and stood behind them so that nothing could come near them. Again, if you carry on through the soldiers, Psalm, Psalm 91, it says in verse 10, no evil shall befall you, no sh- nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways because he has set his love upon you. Isn't that wonderful? God has set his love upon you. Therefore, he will deliver you. And David goes on to say, I will set him on high because he has known my name. He knows you and he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. This is God speaking to his people. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So God leads us to save us, provides a pillar of cloud that not only leads and directs, but provides shade as he can run through where we're safe. He also gives us the pillar of fire, which not only leads and directs us, but protects us and gives us a place of warmth, a place where we can be safe under his wing. So God provides all of these things for his people. How? With his very presence. With his presence. Oh, how we need his presence. It's very interesting uh, when you look back to uh, Moses, who's about to go into the promised land, And at this point, God has sort of just, if you like, um, well, his people have just turned his back on God in the wilderness again through their moaning, their groaning and looking back. And God gets to the point of saying, you go on ahead of me, Moses. I'll send an angel here, go before you. You you go and he'll take you into the promised land. But when the people realized that it was God's angel going before them, but because of their sin, God wasn't going with them. They mourned and they wept, saying, what good is the promised land? unless God's presence is with us. And my favourite preacher, one of them, Martin Lloyd-Jones, says on this point, saying, what good is it to have the success of a growing church, money in the bank, a good reputation, everything's going well on the outside, but this one thing you lack, the presence of God amongst these people. You see, oh, how we need the presence of God. He feeds his people. He satisfies the first of his people. He guides his people. He shelters and he protects his people. If you want to tidy it up a little bit, three Ps. Presence, protection, and a path. Presence, protection, and a path. But let's keep going. We know as we follow the biblical account that as Israel wandered through the desert, that God's presence continued to dwell with them through the temporary tabernacle tents in the Holy of Holies. And then when they entered the promised land into Israel and Jerusalem, they built a temple where God's presence was with them. David asked to build a temple, a house for God, but David couldn't build it because his hands were too stained with war and with blood. So his son Solomon had to build it. And when he did at the end, when the work was completed in Second Chronicles 7, it tells us, as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices. And check this, the glory, that is the Shekinah glory, the radiant, overwhelming light of God came down 
and filled the temple and the priests could not enter the house of God because the glory, the bright, shining light, the Shekinah light of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And it was there that God's presence with his people dwelt with them in the promised land. But the story goes on over time. Israel continued to rebel and turn away and sinned and the kingdom split into two. And eventually they were taken away as captives into Babylon. We looked at this in our Daniel series. And the temple was destroyed and God's presence departed. His Shekinah light, his glory departed. And it's very interesting. 70 uh, years later under Darius, they came back and tried to rebuild the temple. Do you remember during that time? But it wasn't until Herod the Great that the temple was restored to something of its former glory. So its physical glory was restored. But when you read through all of the scripture from that point on, the interesting thing is that even though the physical glory was restored, we never read of God's glory, Shekinah glory, coming back to that place again. So now what you enter during the intertestimonial period, 400 years, is 400 years of darkness. God's glory not there. And we don't see God's glory again. Anyone want to have a guess? God's Shekinah glory. There's radiant light back until Jesus comes back. Jesus the bread, Jesus the water, and now Jesus the light. Exactly as the Isaiah the prophet prophesied regarding the Messiah in Isaiah 9.1. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, remember where we all once were, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy, we have joy and we rejoice before you, says Isaiah. And John announced that prophecy is now here. He does that in the beginning of his book, which is where he starts off the theme of light, where he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And then chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt. The word dwelt means, guess what? Tabernacled. Tabernacled amongst us. The light has dwelt amongst us. It's here with us, his presence. So again, picture the scene. During the festival, the giant candelabras, the temp, temp, temple lit up for all to see. Huge crowds gathering to hear Jesus. And he stands up and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. After that huge period of darkness, Jesus comes in and says, come to me, the light. He is the very glory and the presence of God that has come to be with us. And it is Jesus who leads us where Moses cannot and could not into the final promised land, our final resting place, the new Jerusalem. And the question for the crowds, as is the question for us here today, is do you believe that Jesus is the light of the world? Do you believe that? That he is the light of the world? Jesus, when addressing the Pharisees, stated that their inability to see Jesus for that, from where he had come and where he was going, and who he was in chapter 8, 15, was because they were unable to, to think that way. They were thinking with the flesh. You see, the flesh neither understands that Jesus is the light of the world, nor wants to acknowledge it. It wants to live in darkness. And maybe you can think back to times of your journey of faith and salvation, where you just wanted to stay in the darkness. For me, I was just in a prison of anger and drinking myself to death and just bitterness. I was in that, trapped in that prison, what I needed was to surrender to the light of the world who called me out of that darkness. Those words, I am the light of the world. wonder if you feel your spirit yearning for his light to shine into your life today. Maybe for some of you that's because you've not come to Christ as Lord and you're trapped in that dark prison. Maybe for some of you it's just circumstances of life. Maybe you're battling with addictions or problems or maybe you just feel like you're in a dark place of wilderness at the moment. And you hear Christ's words, come to me, trust who I am. I lead, I protect, I restore, I give shelter, I give warmth, and you can trust me. You know, by Jesus' time, the people were longing for God's glory to refill the temple. 
and for Israel's fortunes to be restored. They were longing for the presence of God. And then it showed up, Jesus. Let me ask you this morning, do you long for the presence of God's light in your life? Do you long for him to shine his light no matter what the cost, shine his wonderful light into your life? That's why he came for us. Not just to show us that he is the light of the world, but follow through our text today so that we might walk in that light. Again, as I said, maybe for some of you, that's a place of wilderness or darkness. Or maybe it's a festival of joy that you're at and you just don't feel that joy. You need Christ's light to shine. Jesus didn't say, I can show you where to find the light. Or a priest or a celebrity or a helpful person. No, he said, I am that light. Come to me. Why? Because it's in Jesus that we find his presence, protection, and a path for our feet. That's why the Bible says he is a lamp and a light unto our feet. You know, as we finish, you know, sometimes we need as believers to remind ourselves of these truths because we so forget, quickly forget. Remember, the whole story is about God's people in the desert who knew who God was and saw his hand at work and yet kept on going their own way and messing it up. But we see the same God who delivered his people out of captivity. It's the same Jesus who came to earth to rescue us from our spiritual captivity by hanging on a cross where through his death and resurrection he overcame darkness. And the same Jesus who delivers us from the kingdom of darkness is the God who loves you and whose presence now dwells not in tabernacles or tents or temples, but in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he will protect you, for brother, brother or sister, for those of you that are in that place. He will protect you. He will be a shelter for you. And he will lead you through this life into his glorious presence once and for all. That's where it's all heading. It's all heading. And the final verse of today is through Revelation chapter 22, 5. This is where it's heading. It says, and when at last we shall see his face. Can't, uh, brother or sister, can you not wait at last to see his face in heaven? Imagine that day when your time on earth is finished and you open your eyes and you see him. It says here, we will see his face and his name will be on their, on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and will reign forever and ever. That's where it's going, this journey. From darkness to the light of the world to walking in light as children of the light, to that great light at last where we get to be with him. And until then, until then, what is the call? First Peter 2.9. But you, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into that light. We have a, a story to tell and a song to sing about the light of the world. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6, and this is just as mind-blowing, in the same way Jesus says, let your light shine before others. You are that light now, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He is the light of the world. He's illuminated our hearts. He's changed us. He's transferred us from darkness into light. And he now says, go and you be that light to a world that is in darkness, pointing towards Jesus, where it is all heading towards. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's pray.